Welcome to the double shot with your favorite cousins, James and Alex Fitzgerald, where we sip our double shots and we talk a bit of flack, pretty much. And then also, we actually do try to weave in a little bit of numbers, some stat facts, cuz, a bit about the real estate and business market generally, see what the Reserve Bank is up to. Would that be a fair assessment? We try and cover it all, and we've got to, we've got a lot to cover today. Uh, there's been uh, some sh- contributions everywhere to this yeah, podcast, uh, which is great. Yeah, no, come on, contributions by me largely. You've done which a massive I never, job. You've I done never a- get recognition for. Which How do you is- know if Alex is busy? You ask her. Ooh, <laughs> harsh, but fair. Now you've done a great job busy, uh, this week. Busy we've pretending got a- how busy I am. We hey, um, we have got a lot to cover. Hey, tell me, uh, how was Adelaide? You were down in Adelaide last week. <laughs> It was it was great, love it. Had a great three days. I'm um, uh, feeling a little bit tired today, actually. It's a, it's always a lot to catch up on when you go away and hit yep. the hit the meetings for three days straight. You, we had like four a day, so it was great. But um, and a lot of time out on the road, walked some dirt, you know, rub it between the old fingers, <laughs> and uh, and then that's how I decide if we if we proceed or not. Oh, nice soil test. What the do you Alex, the soil Alex test? Alex kind, the Alex type of soil yeah. test. Hmm, feels Come. like a H-class. Smells, smells fruity. <laughs> hey, and, uh, and, and tell me, um, it, it's getting a bit cooler down there. I'm heading down this week, going to go watch the Saints play on Saturday, uh, albeit I'm, I'm watching it at an indoor football stadium, so I'm not, not too worried about the weather. But uh, You'll still be cold. It's yeah. seven degrees here, Kazi. You're going to need Ooh. more than that vest, bud. You're going to need Ooh. more than a vest. Speaking of which, you gave the vest a big wrap two weeks ago, and then I... Pop on the Instagram as I do after hours, just sort of like catch up on the day. And your lovely wife, Hannah, is boasting about vest weather. And I'm yep. thinking, you know, these two are just painfully similar. Painfully so. What can I so, say? So, Han, yes, you've got the Kathmandu vest out. Uh, I actually saw James in a vest that was a little bit too small for him a few weeks ago. So I figured he might have accidentally dusted <laughs> yours off before he dusted off his own. <laughs> Uh, like, that is a fallacy. Have you put on weight, Cus, from, from last winter, or is, the, is that your wife's vest? Absolute fallacy. Oh, my days. Hey, we don't yeah. we don't talk about coffee enough, but we, we don't have time today. But mm. I think next week we've got to give coffee a little bit more of a wrap. <laughs> have I just have I just uh, triggered you to take a bit of a sip there? Yeah. yeah. I, I'm massively into pour over coffee at the moment, but not a discussion for today. We'll put that in next week because you and Mitch – discussed and forecasted incorrectly, Mitch, interest rates yes. last week. Yeah, Mitch. Mitch incorrectly forecast. And I did warn him at the time. I said, mm. mate, we're recording on Tuesday. This doesn't come out till Thursday. The RBA announcement comes out Tuesday, Arvo. Yeah. You, you, this could very, date very poorly for you. And he forecast <laughs> that interest rates would not move. And he's fairly adamant. I'm going to say he said it with a bit of gusto. Um, Ooh, he's a betting man, though. He is a betting man. Yeah, so he's a little bit worried that he might not get asked back onto the show should you or I not be available um, <laughs> at, at the next occasion. I like to just keep him waiting. There you go, Schmitty. We'll just keep you in the guessing bay. But, yes, the <laughs> Reserve Bank did increase their interest rates, uh, the cash rate from 0.1 to 0.35. So uh, they call it 25 basis points is what it was increased by. We all knew it was coming. We didn't know exactly when. Mitch definitely didn't know exactly when. Uh, but it did finally happen, and, and it's been massive talk the last seven days, hasn't it? Huge. Yeah, and and normally you get a fair bit out of their statement. The statement didn't give you as much as I think as uh, he, uh, Philip Lowe, the the governor, had a press conference on the Tuesday afternoon, which you could listen to on the radio. So I listened to that on the way home, and I found that was really um, probably the most insightful. He basically just said, hey, we're not in an emergency anymore, so we don't need emergency interest rates of 0.1%. Uh, there's still lots of risks with, you know, Ukraine, China still doing lockdowns. We're not, we're not mm-hmm. there yet, um, but we can afford to increase rates a little bit. Uh, we've got some inflation. We now know that wages are growing. We've seen enough mm. to suggest that wages are growing. So we're going to just gradually increase them. It's a good thing. It means the economy is recovering. Um, don't get too sort of caught up, you know, in terms of what's going to happen in a year or two's time. There's too much going on, but rates will go up because they had to. First interest rate increase in 10 years. In fact, it might have been since 2008, 
has. Is that I th- correct? I think it was 11 years. Yeah, 11 years is, is my understanding. So, you know, I mean, there's a part of me that feels like we've, we've had it pretty good going down in the last sort of 10 years, particularly if you're a first home buyer or uh, like you and me, because uh, those sort of early stage investors who have managed to buy a few properties along the way and, and still have their yields increase as interest mm. rates sort of went down. But I think it's it's only good things for the economy and there are so many different external factors. So, of course, the Reserve Bank have got a lot to take in. But really, you and I aren't too worried. No. I mean, you know, the Reserve Bank have now increased the rate to 0.35%. It was 0.1%. And the 10-year average in that time where interest rates haven't uh, gone up, the 10-year average is 1.6%. We're still 1.3% below the 10-year average. If you look over 30 years, it's, it's like 4%. So we're a mile off that. We could afford interest rates to go up by a percent. Um, you know, uh, even, even today, if you're trying to get a loan, you've got to show that you can service the debt if they went up by 3%. So there's so much conservatism baked into our lending system at the moment. I don't think it's going to have a big impact at all. Uh, it will impact our ability to borrow money though, because um, that's probably the biggest risk that I see is that we might be going for a loan in 12 months time and you yep. might still have to service at 3% above the current rate, which could be 1% higher in a, in a year's time. So it's just going to make it a little bit harder to get a loan. I think if, you, if you're in a position to do something today, uh, that would be a reason to, to do something is just mm. that you never know what's around the corner in terms of your, your borrowing capacity. That's exactly right. And look, I think it it does still all come down to budgeting as well and just making sure you know exactly what's going on with your money. And I will transition there to a new app that I've learnt about. It's called Fudget. Fudget. Play on budget. Basically, Nikki. Like a, did you say face budget? A fake budget. I thought you were going for like Facebook. Oh, no. But it's it's a fudget. Social media budgeting. I wasn't sure, wasn't sure where you were going with that one. But in any event, uh, nifty little budgeting app. So if you still don't really understand how the whole interest rate thing works and why you're not in danger, well, maybe listen to this podcast a little bit more. But also you can do all of your budgeting. Now, two little things. One, you've got an awesome budgeting tool because uh, on the Bulletproof Investing website that you put together yourself, uh, hard slog putting that one together for the people, and that's also free, it I was. understand. Or you can have a look at this budgeting app called Fudget, and you find basically you can plug in all your ingoings, your outgoings, really easy way to keep track of everything, and it will show you basically how, how to budget yourself. Um, and honestly, not a bad thing to do, even if um, – you're not struggling or whatever. It's, it's always good money habits to know what's going on, you know, where your money is and, and stuff like that. So just thought I'd, I'd share that with the people because I did learn about it last week and I thought I downloaded it, checked it out. I quite like it. Cool. So what's it's just a budgeting app? Like what's the F mean in, in budget? Fudge it, mate. Yeah, but why, 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 the, why fudge it? What's the, oh. the reference to fudging or, or, or the F? Maybe is it free budget? Maybe no, no, I I don't know. Maybe be, maybe because oh fuck it, let's do a budget. <laughs> oh, <laughs> surely not. And therefore, this could maybe be because you fudge your budget, like you fudge it. You you lie, you're lying to yourself, so you fudge it. Okay, all right. I don't know. I didn't even think about that. I just thought it's fun. It's quirky. It's probably aimed at uh, the. The younger generation and fudget is fudget is very similar to budget. I don't know. Well, that might be something interesting and fun, in fact, to figure out going into next week's pod. Uh, but no I, hint taken. I, I, I really want to uh, move to our favourite segment or the listeners' favourite segment, which is our fun fact of the week or stat fact. However, we stat stat, stat fact the stat man stat fact. Indeed, stat fact. I've got the stat fact this week, cars, and you have got the fun fact. You always give me grip and say, I'm not getting the call up, but you have today. I saw you put it in. Uh, it, you know, it's yours. It's yours. Take it. I just so, want to make sure it is, in fact, fun. Fun fact. Fun fact that I found over the course of the weekend is uh, <laughs> two things. Number one, potable water, P-O-T-A-B-L-E, potable water. That means water that is safe for drinking. Drinkable. And only 0.5% of all of the world's water 
is safe to drink and and defined as potable. Only 0.5%, not a lot. Uh, And I imagine the reason for that is that so much of the world's water is in the ocean, which Mm. uh, obviously full of salt, uh, which is its own story, which I wanted to segue to going into uh, this week. As I understand it, you've done a little experiment over the weekend with salt water. <laughs> this is the fun part of my I fun fact. I don't have fact. any idea what you're talking about. <laughs> no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, I drank a bunch of salt water and they called it a cleanse. Let's just leave it there. Okay, some form of natural laxative. All right. Absolute <laughs> stitch up. Are you freaking serious? But well, I can't, can't say the F bomb, but you can bring cleanse. up me Sunday cleanse. I, uh, oh, I tell you I, what, I've led- got the stat fact. I've got the stat fact for this week. <laughs> I'm led to believe that there's three three people in our company who have done that little uh, experiment over the weekend I, with salt I water. Take, you you are one of them, as I understand it. I take it. my health very seriously because you may binge on donuts, but I spend my Sundays doing cleanses. <laughs> and we're going to leave it there. We're going to leave it there. Uh, Park your car, get out. We're leaving it here. Drinking non-potable water. Anyway, stat so, fact. <laughs> carry on. All right, so, stat fact. Survey done by financial comparison mob called Mozo, M-O-Z-O. Never heard of them, but that's okay. Very interesting. Uh, they said uh, they did this survey uh, basically about people's loyalties, I suppose, to their, their banks, particularly the big four. 73% of people claim to have never changed banks I've never. never changed banks. I've never changed banks either. And this is, we're talking about like your everyday account, what you get wow. paid into, like where was your first bank account when you got your first job or when your parents opened up your first bank account. 62% of savings accounts are with those big four banks. Not really surprised. I also fit into that category. Do you? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, there you yep. go. In fact, uh, I've got two savings accounts, both with big four. Yep. There you go. Ah, see, where well, I'm exactly the same. Uh, so, 55 uh, percent of people said their parents introduced them um, to the the big four. So, pretty much same as me. There was like, all right, you're 13, you're getting a bank account uh, with your first job. Let's go down to to NAB. That's just who I've always uh, had my day to day stuff with. 48 um, percent, it's be said because. That's where all their financial products are. So their home loan, their yeah. personal loans is all with one bank. It's just much yeah. easier or it's because I know and like them. Maybe there is a level of like relationship loyalty there. Mm. Um, and then the the balance said of 20% said that uh, their perception was the big four carried more security. So that's why they had... Um, their savings accounts and their all their deposits with the big four. So pretty interesting stuff. Pretty I'm interesting with, um, stuff there. My, one of my savings accounts is with the Commonwealth Bank, which I've had since I was five or six years old through their Dolomites program. Oh my in, god! Uh, I in school, Dolomites. you had to you set up a bank account. And your mum and dad would give you like a, a gold coin to take in every week and and deposit into the Dolomites account. So such a smart marketing exercise for Combank, isn't it? I'm that pretty still sure they're got not me at 31 years old. Good on them. Yeah. <laughs> That's a 26-year relationship they formed with me as a five-year-old. I wonder it how much money seems, they made out of you. Yeah, it sort of doesn't seem uh, all, all that... Um, kosher. Yeah, kosher. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, There you go. So that was go. my little stat fact for the week. If we want to outro that one, Nico. Stat fact! Okay, let's talk about the biggest building, biggest commercial building that's being built in Australia right now, the <laughs> Salesforce building. Now, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, when we went to San Francisco, I, I'm going to say uh, five or six years ago, I think you were on, you were on that trip. I didn't get a gig on that oh, trip. Oh, you didn't get so a trip. Any, anyway, yeah, yeah. The, the biggest Bolt building in, in San wounds. Francisco is the Salesforce Tower, and it's, uh, it's like... 20 or 30 huh. stories bigger than any other building there. So seems like we've got a, a similar landmark being built on our very own shores in Australia. Sounds like Salesforce have got a bit of a tall poppy complex, don't they? They're <laughs> yeah. like, we've got to be the biggest and we have to have our big Salesforce logo on the top of that building, towering and looking down on all the other buildings. Yes, Lendlease have built this absolute mammoth of a building. It's... um. Now Sydney's tallest commercial tower, as you just alluded to, 55 storeys, and it's just topped out. This is a $1.9 billion tower, 263 metres, uh, and it's it's Sydney's Jeez. first 
steel framed high rise in 25 years. Wow. How amazing is that? I didn't realize you could do steel frame that high, but I, no. I genuinely don't know. What so, are the others built out of um, co- concrete? I, I also do not know that, but it wasn't, when you think about it, if they've been building it for four years, it wasn't a timber shortage necessity that they had to mm. build out a steel frame. So they obviously had this plan to do it prior to, you know, supply shortages, et cetera. Um, but really interesting because it's an absolute beast uh, of a project. And and I suppose sort of moving on from there as a, as a segue, uh, was, Len Lease have, have actually... Just, sorry, I was just going to say on that... Man. 55 levels, the one in San Francisco is 61, and they occupy the whole building. Salesforce occupies 61 floors in a building. And and for those not familiar, (sighs) Salesforce is a uh, CRM, which must... Yeah. Nico, you could probably... How do you not know? We use Salesforce. Tell us, what does CRM mean? Central reporting. Oh, (laughs) jeez. I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have thought like customer relationship management. Software. CRM I would have gone with that. I would have gone with that. Anyway, I know what anyway, CRM is, but I don't know what it stands for. Basically helps you deal with all the people that you're dealing with in your business. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Prob- and probably, I mean, it sounds like they are. Uh, so my statement might support, but they're probably the biggest and, and probably one of the best in the world because they can integrate with a lot of different systems. But Massive, I don't believe they're actually taking all 55 stories levels here in Sydney. Uh, I read something about a couple of other uh, major companies looking at, at taking mm. out some floors there. But yeah, what I was going to say... 20 floors they're taking in this one. There you go. What mm. I was going to say, though, is that, uh, interestingly, Lendlease built that. Mm. Uh, and I knew I know Lendlease do a lot of building. They also do a lot of developing. They're in apartments, townhouses, greenfield, where we're in, uh, but a lot of construction. And, in fact, uh, last week a a article, if you will, was released by the urban developer, and it went through the top 10 biggest construction companies in Australia today. And I was actually very surprised to see Lendlease is, in fact, number one. Are you, does that surprise wow. you? I thought it would be Multiplex, biggest builder in Australia. But maybe because Lendlease does their own stuff as well, so they've got, I guess, a, a big blend. But Lendlease, uh, at the end of 2021, commenced 80 new projects, $20.6 billion total value. Massive. And then second yeah. to that, Maltese, who I thought were the were the biggest, they commenced fourteen projects last year. Total about ba- total value four point six billion. What do you got there? You got a so you're ranking six- them. You're ranking them by uh, like a, I'm just wondering how it gets ranked. Is it ranked by total, total billings for the last twelve months, or is it total um, jobs that they've picked up and the value, value of those jobs in the last value 12 months? of jobs. Value of jobs commenced in 2021. Wow. Value and numbers. So, yeah, it really so does Lendlis, surprise me. Lendlease is number one. I would have Lendlis thought multiplex. Two, I mean, obviously, Pro, is, Pro Build and Growcon were gone. up there, both gone. now now gone. Wiped off the face of the the top ten. They weren't even in the top ten. Those ones. But Gee. that's a massive disparity between one and two. That's about it's nearly sixteen billion dollars. <laughs> well, I think it's um, a lot. I think too. Lendlease build, as I understand it, they build some road and infrastructure. Yep. They obviously build residential buildings and commercial buildings like Multiplex do. I think they mm. also build schools and hospitals and those sorts of things. So Everything. maybe because they build a whole bunch of different types of, um, of buildings. Very diversified. Um, but yeah, okay, there we go. And and uh, who's number three? Uh, uh, construction company called Built. You might have seen them around. <laughs> Built. What a name. Built. Built. Yep, they just thought, you know, <laughs> they must have had the marketing guys go go underground, come out two days later. No, we just can't come up with it. How go back we, underground we, for another 24 hours. We've got it. How do we best We've describe what we do? Yeah, built. Times New Roman. Orange. Huge. <laughs> anyway, they've got nice. 89 projects they commenced in 2021. Total value $2.9 billion. Uh, so, like, not quite half of multiplex, but significantly yeah. less um, from one to three, isn't it? It's quite interesting. Uh, and then also uh, number four and five, uh, you've got Hutchies, uh, who are a big mob out of Queensland and, and do stuff uh, also interstate, and then Adco. So, like a lot of big, a lot of big builders at the moment, and big infrastructure and uh, commercial precincts going up. So really interesting and interesting to see how many projects each of them have. They've got quite a lot, uh, with sort of like a an average 
value of each project sitting in the in the millions. So pretty interesting stuff, I thought. I agree. Sorry, guys, I do just want to add that uh, off the back of the, the biggest construction companies, and we've talked about construction costs a lot because they really have gone up substantially uh, in the last 12, 24 months. Uh, a recent report by Macro Monitor says we cannot actually expect those construction costs to come back down anytime soon. Now, I found this, I find this interesting. So we've got a lot of clients saying to me, well, you know, if I buy a property now, you know, what if construction comes back down and it'll be worth 50 grand less? Well, you know, we can't fix these. Sorry, my microphone's banging against the thing. We can't fix these overnight. Um, massive like back, back-end supply chain issues. But the total construction sector uh, inflation will hit about 9.5% over the year to June 2022, so by the end of next month. And their forecast is that uh, there'll be another 6% construction inflation over the year to from July to December. So can't expect those to come back down anytime soon, Kaz. Yeah, so uh, Macro Monitor is the group who've done that report, and they are. They're forecasting that some costs will come back, but there's still some uh, costs like uh, petrol, fuel, and um, mm. wages that are probably going to go up in the short term. So they're, they're sort of forecasting that whilst the cost increases may subside a little bit, uh, we're probably like likely to see at best a flat lining of construction costs. So anyone I'm who okay has been that. wondering that, you're right. I, I do get that a, a bit as well. Hey, um, uh, one, one other thing, um, just going back to the big four banks, they've put up their deposit rates off the back of the announcement oh. from the Reserve Bank. Okay. And they've put them up a lot. So I don't know if you pay much attention to putting cash in a bank and, and getting a return. It's probably a little bit too low risk for what you're doing, uh, and it certainly <laughs> is for me too. Uh, but for 18 months, if you're willing to tie up somewhere between $5,000 and $2 million with the big four banks, they will pay you an interest rate today on your money of 2.25% which they increased by 1.95% last week. Hey, I was going to say, the average of the big four for the last 12 months has been like 0.23% of a percent interest you'll make on your moolay. They just put it up to 2.25%, nearly 2 full percent, despite the RBA only putting uh, the cash rate up by 0.25%. Um, it says to me that the banks have been sitting on our dosh making a little bit too much money off it for some Ooh. time now. And that would prove to be the case, or seem to be the case <sighs> rather, because our big four banks, would you read about it, have made a combined profit, combined, of more than uh, $15 billion in the past 12 months. Zero surprises. Zero surprises. Cash Zero. rate's been 0.1 of a percent, and still, you're like, what's the, the average... Interest rates been sort of like two to two and a half percent. Yep. And then think about that. You think about that. That's called margin. Hey, tell me which of the big four. If I was uh, to say to you, uh, and this is uh, following Mitch and I did a little pop quiz for each other last week. I've been trying I to get you with that one. Was absolutely every adorable. So often, uh, pop quiz for you. If you had to rank <laughs> the big four banks, so you got CBA, ANZ, NAB, and Westpac. If you had to rank them by uh, size, where would you have them all sitting? Okay. Number one, Westpac. Yep. Number two, Combank. Number three, NAB. Number four, ANZ. Okay. Uh, okay, so there's a couple of ways you can look at it. If you go, you can go by profit, or you can go by total, um, like money that they've got. Um, total money. I was going total money. T total money. Well, well, CBA is number one, and by a fair way. Ah, I said bloody Westpac. You know they both yeah. have the yellow branding. Actually, no, Westpac is now red, isn't it? Just forget I said then, that. Then, then, then you've got then you've got Westpac, and then you've got NAB, and, and then ANZ. Oh, so okay, so the the one and two, I was just a little bit. Yes. 
But yeah, I'm, a, surprisingly, I'm a colours and visual person, so the, it's the yellow and black that really is just it's just set me off. Oh, you know? <laughs> right, mate. It's just set me off. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I know that Nab's three, oh. red and black, hey, number yeah. four, A and Z blue. See, so very visual person. It, it might mm-hmm. surprise. It, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I don't it may believe surprise myself. You, it may surprise you to know that uh, Nab is more profitable than Westpac, even though they've got less money. So uh, there you go. It's not. It's not you, all about you, the money. It's you and about I both. The, are, you and I are both a customer of uh, Nab. Maybe they're making a bit too much money off us too. I'm refinancing after this call. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you've managed to be under a rock and hiding from the election, good on you because you just can't get away from it at the moment. And I feel like I wouldn't mind a little bit of a break, wouldn't you? Like I'm sick of talking about politics. But anywho, we do. We do like to see though. As we get to the sort of pointier end of the actual election, you're planning your birthday party. You've got, you've, it's a bipartisan birthday party. Correct. Bipartisan party. On election day. Absolutely. Yes, yep. On election day. Um, you have been paying a little bit of attention, cousin, fair enough. But particularly, uh, they've finally had a little bit of difference in some policy. And uh, you have found that to be in their uh, sort of like housing schemes or their first home buyer grants. Please do tell us more. Well, one thing I will say is that these are only ideas at this stage uh, on both sides of of government. Um, But the Liberals who've got the new home guarantee that they're running at the moment, and we've talked Mm -hmm. about that in previous podcasts. Uh, Long story short, you can borrow up to 95% uh, with the government guaranteeing the the difference between the 80 and the 95, Uh, but you still got to take out the loan for 95%. You still got to make the repayments, um, but you just pay the the 5% of your own money, um, and then you pay the government back uh, at some point when you can refinance, et cetera. the Labor government, though, have come out with a different policy. Uh, it's called the Help to Buy, and it's different in the sense that what the government actually do is they're going to lend you, say, uh, the 15% instead. If I use the same example, uh, so rather than borrowing 95%, you're only going to borrow 80%. They're going to lend you the 15%, and what they're going to do instead is they're going to take a 15% interest in the value uplift of the property. So they'll get their 15% back, and then as the property <laughs> grows in value, they'll take 15%. Uh, the rationale being that the Liberal government's policy is very good uh, for the past two, three years where you've had a very low interest rate environment and the concern's been raising the deposit. Uh, whereas now as interest rates start to increase, Labor is saying, well, you know, we're, we're going to make it easier for you where you're only going to have to make the repayments on the 80%, so your repayments are going to be less. It still solves the deposit problem. Uh, and obviously the, the downside being that you, you don't get all of the profit or growth mm. in that property. Which uh, one would you prefer? And and answer one, one second. I've just got to get my charger for my laptop. You, Which one would you prefer? <laughs> All right. Well, Alex goes away. She's not even going to hear this. So we'll test her when I when I when uh, when she gets back here for those listening. I would probably prefer the federal government's one uh, at the moment just because there's a little bit more detail. It seems to have a higher um, income threshold. So the Labor government have got a lower income threshold than the Liberal government do at the moment. And then that to me, has been the biggest hurdle for people becoming eligible. Um, so, look, at, I, I would say that that would be uh, the, the party's policy that I favour. Do you get all that? <laughs> Liberal. Yeah, you, oh, you heard you, me say that, did you? Okay. No, I didn't. Yeah. No, I didn't. I'm just guessing because I would have thought that you would have preferred to keep the 15% uplift uh, because, you know, it, like that could, yeah. could be substantial. Uh, well, no, it but, guess, but it's actually. also it's more so that um, uh, the Labor government have got an income threshold of ninety thousand for a single, hundred and twenty thousand for a couple, whereas mm. the uh, Liberal government they have expanded Fire. that to one hundred and twenty five thousand for individuals and yes. two hundred thousand for couples. So it's the income that that probably sways me to the Liberal one because I feel it um, offers more um, people the opportunity. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm not too worried about the 15% because I think having less repayments, I sort of see that those two offset each other in a way. Um, 
how how you deal with that, I, I don't know. And, and and certainly there would be issues, you know, if you go and renovate your home, how do you figure out, um, who, you know, who, who gets the, the uplift? So Absolute there, but, nightmare. But that's why I say, you know, at the outset, we don't know. They're just ideas at this stage. They're do- they're all ideas. But they are they're different, all ideas. which is nice. It's nice to have some different policies to consider. And I will actually be casting my vote this week. I'm going to go to a pre-poll because uh, I haven't had COVID yet. And I'm thinking, what if I get COVID on the day I'm supposed to vote? Um, I'll tell you, you'll get a $70 fine. My one vote out of $25 million could be the difference. It's meant to be a very close election. And that's <laughs> the right attitude. To have cars. But seriously, we have indulged in this podcast. It's gone way too long. We have indulged beyond belief. So thank you so much for listening today, guys. Uh, we'll we'll still hit up James. Maybe we'll be able to get a, a bit of a uh, who who we voted for next week. Ooh, I doubt it, but we will try. We will try. I think you've got a lot of research you want to be doing overnight to uh, see where your vote's going to land. I know you're a bit of a swing voter. But if you like the podcast, please recommend us to your friends. Follow us on Instagram and uh, pop us a review maybe, especially if it's nice, especially if it's good. Pop us a review. Any last closing points, Cuzzy Moto? No. Good luck with uh, the non-potable water cleanse this weekend. That's just, that's just a stitch up. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Double Shot with your favourite cousins, Alex and James Fitzgerald. If you've got a burning question or something we absolutely need to talk about on the pod, please write to us. Both of our emails are in the show notes. For little real estate tidbits and a little bit of banter, okay, a lot of banter, you can follow us on the gram. Our handle is the doubleshot.podcast. That, my friends, is the doubleshot.podcast. Until next time, think of us when you sit back and sip your next double shot.